Good evening, everybody. And on this first day of spring, welcome to another uh, tasting session powered by Sinoco. Uh, and we're going to have some fun with whiskey tonight. Um, and we're having, um, we're having whiskeys from, I think, the most beautifully named distillery in the world, from Heaven Hill. Uh, so that promises a lot, I think. Um, and we also have a very uh, nice guy talking to us about these whiskies, which is uh, the European brand educator for Heaven Hill, Mr. Benji Burslow. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, How everybody. Good to see you. How are you doing tonight, Benji? Very well. Very happy to be here. Always good to drink and talk. I should say talk whiskey. Always whiskey. good to educate, yeah, yeah. we have to say, Benji. Educate, yes. Drink responsibly. <laughs> Perfect. And often. And often, and often, and Heaven Hill. Yeah, always. Yeah. <laughs> always. Um, I think you're going to talk us through a bit of the history, a bit of the production mm -hmm. process, and uh, some of, uh, six of, uh, of your uh, whiskies. Um, so maybe it's, it's best if we just start out straight away and go well, ahead. Thanks. Take, take control, Benji. Thank you very much. So I am just going to share this with you. He says confidently and then can't. There we go. Everyone see that okay? See That's the screen perfect. all right? Yeah, I'm good. We're good. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you for the introduction. Thanks for joining. Um, we're going to talk through a little bit of Heaven Hills history. Um, we've been going for 86 years last December. Um, so we've been through some highs and some lows and some highs again throughout our history. So I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, those. Um, also a bit about how we produce and um, make our whiskies and how we do that slightly differently to others and what the areas are that you kind of play with to make your whiskies a little bit different uh, and some of the regulations obviously that we have to adhere to to be able to make our whiskies because we're a very tightly reg regulated spirit category. So I'll start right at the start which is the best place to start. So we were started um, by Harry and Joe Bean, actually, two members of the Bean family. Harry is the grandson of Jochen Bean, who later became Jim Bean, um, a very prestigious distilling family from Kentucky. Um, they're actually from Germany originally, and they were ended up in Kentucky, or what was then Virginia, around about the 1780s or 1790s originally. That's the Bean, where the Bean family started. Their lineage and family have continued on throughout the bourbon, uh, and we still have many Bean family members working for us at Heaven Hill now. And we even share a yeast strain with, Heaven, uh, with Jim Beam as well, which I'll come on to a little bit later. We were started in 1935. Um, this is on the back end of Prohibition uh, being repealed. That was repealed on December the 6th, 1933. This is when, obviously, after that was a, a, a repealed, there was a lot of investment into new distilleries or distilleries starting back up again. And Harry and Joe have been down in Juarez in Mexico, making their whiskey down there during Prohibition. Obviously, with the 13 years of Prohibition, uh, some distillers went north to Canada, some went south down to Mexico. They went to Canada, they would make rye. If they went down to Mexico, they would make their own version of bourbon, obviously because of corn. Um, so that's where Harry and Joe went. And when Prohibition was repealed, they saw it as their chance to come back up and start their own distillery away from the Bean family members. So they looked for investment into their distillery, which is the uh, beautiful distillery in the background that, that you've got going on in your one up there uh, yeah. on the right hand side. Um, this is the original distillery that we had, um, the, which is from originally was a farm. Um, so it's. The distillery itself is named the William Heaven Hill Farm. So Heaven Hill was the surname of the farmer that used to own the land. It was very common to have a still on the farms as it was a way of preserving your grains throughout the winter. So you could trade them or drink them, whatever you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a byproduct, particularly of agriculture. Where we are in Kentucky is a very big agriculturally led state uh, with lots and lots of fields, crops and so on and so forth corn and of course the biggest one of that um but when we so when we first started off we actually leased this um bit of land uh, you can see that beautiful old rick house in the background there on the sort of the back left um there was a few rick houses on there a, a little distillery uh and i think it was 100 acres of land that they leased now they didn't have all the money themselves the bean family so they went to another successful family in the area 
and that was the, the five very well dressed gentlemen on the left hand side there. They look great, don't they, Benji? They look like yeah. a barbershop quintet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know they're going to talk really fast. Hey, yeah. what, what's up with you? Hey, what's up with you? <laughs> um, high, high, high trousers, fast talking. Um, yeah, so they, these uh, these guys were the sons of a Lithuanian immigrant who had gone to Kentucky at the end part of the 19th century. And he had built up his um, his business by selling things door to door originally, Max Shapiro this was, uh, and then he built that up and he uh, eventually ended up doing it with a horse and cart and then eventually ended up having three department stores around Kentucky, which his five sons ran for him, which is why the five brothers are here. So they had no experience at all in whiskey, <clears throat> no experience in, in the distilling industry at all. Um, but when the Beam family came to them, they must have done a good sales job on them or their name maybe have carried whatever yeah. it was. They decided to invest with them. So they invested the other, uh, I believe it was $47,500 into um, starting the distillery. And not long after that, it was around about, uh, it was about four years after uh, coming up to the start of the Second World War, the Beams decided that they wanted to get out and they liquidized their assets. And the Shapiro family bought them out of the distillery, um, which meant that the distillery then came under one family ownership, which is where it is today. And we are still owned by the Shapiro family today. In fact, we are the largest owned and operated family distillers in America. So we have a great size, but we are still 100% family owned, which is very, very important to wow. um, what we do today. And in fact, Max, believe it or not, who is the son of the guy who's filling the barrel there, uh, met, emailed me just before this meeting saying about, uh, because obviously I send him my reports and stuff, and he keeps a very, very close eye on what's going on. So we're actually, even though our company is 86 years old, we're still only on our second uh, level of, uh, of ownership. So it's the son of the guy filling the barrel is, is our CEO currently. It's actually quite amazing that it's still family owned. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, we're, and it's, it's being family owned, but also operated is, is mm -hmm. rarity. We have a few families still going in, in um, distilling, obviously, you know, beams and, and um uh, the Brown Foremans, Galvin Browns, or you know, whichever ways you want to look at them, they are, you know, great history in, in things. But actually operating the distilleries and kind of keeping those on, that's that's a rarity. They are, they're there by name a lot of them, but not, they don't do the day to day operations like I say that we definitely do because I still get emails from Max every day, pretty much. <laughs> so he, he's definitely there operating in some way or another. Um, so the products on the left here, the old Heaven Hill style. This is the first product that we released um this was back in 1939 so we filled our first barrel on december the 13th 1935 but the first product we made was a bottled in bond old heaven hill style now this is not a million miles away from some of the brands that we have today and one of the most important things about this one the first product that we made is actually bottled in bond which is something that's very close to our styles now very close to our hearts we continue on the bottled and bonds at a time where they haven't been quite so fashionable, I would say, in American distillation. Um, at the time that we started our distillery, bottled and bond was really a uh, moniker of the good stuff. It was show. It was if you had bottled and bond written on the label, you knew it was of a certain quality. And we'll cover exactly what bottled and bond is a little bit later in the mm -hmm. presentation. But it really did mean it was. It got known as the good stuff. So when we started our distillery, that's what we wanted to make right from the get-go. And this is why we still produce a lot of bottled and bond products today. In fact, we're going to be trying a couple of them a little bit later. Um, we we keep that uh, tradition alive. And in fact, we still make, I believe it's 10 different bottled and bond products at Heaven Hill, which considering that there's, probably, there's close to over 5,000 different American whiskeys individual types of American whiskey and about 60 of those are bottled in bond from that 5,000. Okay, just 1%. From that, yeah, and from that 10 of them are ours. So wow. it's a real big important part and we've, like I say, we've kept them going when other brands haven't. Jim Beam got rid of their um, bottled in bond many years ago but because we started with it, it stays with us. It's part of our makeup mm -hmm. and it's important for, for what we do with our whiskey. So that's what we first started out doing was um, Old Heaven Hill bottled in bond which would have been ready around about 1939, 1940. Now, we've just come off 13 years of not being able to make or sell 
uh, or buy alcohol in America. And then we hit the Second World War. And unfortunately, we get stopped for, um, uh, we are only allowed to make industrial strength alcohol for the war effort. Um, so in 1942, when America gets involved in the Second World War, they stop all commercial production in America, and we were only allowed to make um, industrial strength alcohol, which would then go on to make paraffin and parachutes and uh, help um, release torpedoes and things like that, um, which meant that we had three years where we couldn't make any whiskey again. So with that 13 years, only been back to it for sort of six or seven years and then stopping again. When we came back to uh, distilling in 1945 at the end of the Second World War, we started increasing production hugely because we had a lot of depleted stocks. Now, the whiskey tastes and styles had changed somewhat, or what people wanted had certainly started to change. And people weren't drinking whiskey the same way as what they were before the war. You know, a lot of GIs have been stationed in Europe. They've been drinking white spirits, gins and vodkas and things like that, which they didn't get in America before that time. And they're starting to switch to these lighter style of drinks. You've got um, tequila, which did very well during Prohibition, coming up through California and into Texas, uh, along with the Margarita cocktail, which became the biggest cocktail in the world in the 1950s. And then you've got James Bond drinking martinis. And <laughs> you know, it's all about white spirits, about that lighter kind of style. And even American whiskey started being produced to a lighter style of liquid. They weren't about this big, heavier kind of stuff. But we had been overproducing because we thought that the, 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 um, the, the desire would still be at the same height, and it wasn't. And we, hadn't, we were having to reproduce and, and fill up our stocks that had all been depleted. So along with the fact that the Korean War was on the horizon and they thought that they were going to get another point in time where they were going to have to stop mm -hmm. distilling, which actually never came, they continued doing it, but all of the series of word about it was the fact that we ended up producing a lot of spirit and not really having a huge amount to do with it. So come the 1950s, coming into the 1960s, we're getting whiskies that are aging past their normal kind of age. Before the 1950s, you didn't get bourbon going past six years. Six years is your absolute max, really. Uh, in fact, they used to sell, uh, they used to say if, um, if the whiskey was older than six years old, that's the stuff that you, you can't sell. <laughs> and they used to spare a lot more when they sell it, but that's the stuff that you can't sell, so I'm not going to buy it. So it wasn't very fashionable. It wasn't the style of liquid that they were after in those times. It was between four and six years. That's where it was seen as the sweet spot for American whiskey. And anything older than that, you just seen as uh, that's the you know the the, the with the distilleries have just been holding on to that stuff and haven't actually been able to sell it. So in 1957, we released a brand um, called Evan Williams, which was in name of the first licensed distiller in Kentucky. So Evan Williams was actually from Wales in the UK originally, uh, like many people who had fled the UK and moved across to uh, America in the 1750s, 1760s, and took with them a lot of knowledge of distillation and making whiskey as, as well with, with the Celts, with the Irish, the Scotch, the Welsh, Cornish, and went over to America and started making whiskey over there. And Evan Williams was the first licensed distiller in Kentucky in 1783. So we named the whiskey in honor of him. It's not his recipe or anything like that. It's just named in honor of him. When the brand was released, we released it in this beautiful glass decanter, you know, because yeah, this brand this, was older. This was also the, the decade that the stoppers of bottles needed to be as large as the bottles themselves. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, but we're coming off the high trousers, so we needed to re replace it with, with yeah. you know, equally big. Uh, stoppers yeah quite um and th this is kind of the problem with it because the glass was very expensive as you can imagine uh they switched a lot of these to ceramic um kind of styles as well uh, jim beam actually bought a ceramic factory that's how much they were producing uh decanters in the ceramic styles and this was a great way a you hid the whiskey so you can see the kind of color of it as well in the ceramic ones um and also had a little bit of fun to it as well jim beam did one in a um temping bowling pin Mm -hmm. uh, there's some in uh, Mictors did ones in a Sphinx and things like that. So we, it, it become the kind of style of the 50s and 60s was to release whiskey. Very, very, it, yeah. very yeah, gimmicky and, too. Uh, in, in, exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, funny enough, it's come back round, and, yeah. um, and and our highest end whiskeys are the same. But back in those days, nobody was nobody was going for it. 
people weren't buying these whiskies in their style. They were like, no, that's, I don't want this kind of whiskey. And Evan Williams was at least seven years old, which for a whiskey at that time was, was very old. Mm. Uh, and we released it in this uh, lovely decanter and nobody bought it. Nobody wanted it. Uh, it didn't do very well. And in fact, the brand was actually going to be axed. And uh, if, if it wasn't for somebody at the, uh, at the distillery was like, well, hold, hold on a minute. The whiskey that we're making is good. But the way that we're dressing up isn't necessarily the kind of style. So we switched the labeling and the bottling into a cheaper, more generic kind of style of, Amer of, of whiskey bottle, which is the square bottle, which, you know, it's exactly kind of, I mean, it's not really that much different from the picture that's on the, mm -hmm. on the presentation, really. Uh, in fact, this is actually an old bottle. One of the newer bottles is probably even closer to that. Um, is, is this the, the time that people can try the first whiskey? Benji? Yes, absolutely. This is a good time to try the Evan Williams Black now, if you've got that one in front of you. Yeah, on, on your label, it says uh, Evan Williams Straight Bourbon. So it's the one with the black label. But on your sample labels, it says Straight Bourbon. So, so we either call this, Yeah, we either call this Evan Williams Black or Evan Williams Extra Aged. Or I mean, the reason why we call it Extra Aged, and you'll see it on the side of the bottle there that you were just holding up, mm -hmm. um, the reason that we call it extra aged is because like when we put it in the bottle back in those days, this go, we leave this in the bottle longer than our competitors at the same rate. This is an entry level whiskey. This is our flagship whiskey at Heaven Hill. It's the most important one to us. Mm -hmm. It's made us survive throughout um, our uh, history throughout the 20th century. And if it wasn't for Evan Williams, we wouldn't be the company that we are today, to be quite honest. Um, this is the mash bill that's uh, on the on the screens now. So, 78% the blue part is the corn. Obviously, we're a bourbon, so it must be at least 51% corn in our mash bill. 10% of it is rye. 12 and a half. 12% uh, of it is malted barley. So we do that at the start. We mix the grains or mash the grains together at the start before we've fermented or distilled them. Unlike in other kind of spirits, we do it all at the start. We make our mash first, which is these um ratios of grains and then we cook them and then we ferment and then distill and then mature and age and we'll get into all those processes in a little bit but that's the way that we do it in american whiskey so it's a mixture of those grains so more corn corn is obviously a, a sweeter more buttery kind of style um grain can be quite one directional there's not huge amounts of uh spiking different kind of flavors that you get from corn which is why we use rye is our flavor and gravy which where it brings a lot of spice the nutty menthol kind of flavors that will come through and the malted barley we always use as uh to help convert the enzymes in the rye from starch into sugar before we add the yeast and turn it into ethanol so it helps it speeds up the process of converting the enzymes in the starches which is why yep. we use it and it also gives you that kind of like biscuity kind of flavor to, mm. the, to, the, to the liquid as well <coughs> I see already uh, Wim, uh, Wim in the chat is saying lovely right touch to the nose. So uh, mm -hmm. that's exactly yeah, what, you, the, what you were going it for. It allows so. that spice to come through. And we're, 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 we're at this kind of, it's extra age. So we go to be a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. If we was to break down each of those words, Kentucky means you must be made in Kentucky, pretty obviously. <laughs> uh, but you must also be aged for at least one year in Kentucky. Now we age all of our products in Kentucky. We're a Kentucky Distillery, I'll show you some of the places that we age them in a little bit, but we age everything in Kentucky. But to be on a label and say Kentucky, you've got to age it there for one year and be made there. Straight means that it has come, it's an old term, it meant straight from the barrel into the bottle. <clears throat> so it means that you haven't put any additives to it. There's no colouring, there's no anything like that. We are the only dark spirit category in the world which has banned caramel colouring. So it's very, very important to what we do. And this actually comes from the Bottled in Bond Act. It's a, it's a Passover from that. So straight means that we cannot add anything to it after distillation, apart from pure water and charcoal filtration. That's it. We can't do anything else. And chill proofing as well. So we can change, you know, we can, in that kind of sense. But we can't add anything to it after distillation whatsoever. It also means, and this is the most important thing of having straight on the label, it means it will be aged for a minimum of two years mm -hmm. if it's got straight. If it just says bourbon whiskey, it just has to spend a period of time in wood. So that doesn't mean there's an age statement to it. It literally can be almost poured in from the top of it into the barrel and taken out the bottom, and that's a period of time. Don't, you don't have to be particularly straight with it. Straight is very, very important to 
what it is that we do. All of our whiskies will be straight and pretty much any of the big guys you'll see straight written on there. And if, you are un, if your youngest whiskey is under four years old, you must write it on the label to tell people they're drinking a young whiskey. So if you see Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, you know that, people, that, that, that the youngest whiskey in that bottle is four years old and one day. Otherwise, they would have to write it somewhere on the bottle to tell you you're drinking a young one, which is why we say we're extra aged, because that's the minimum requirement to be a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey is to be four years old. But we, our youngest whiskey in uh, Evan Williams Black is five years and the oldest one's up to about six and a half years. So the average age of this whiskey is actually about five and a half years, which is why we say it's that kind of older style. And that's where we sort of keep the same kind of style as what we used to do. And it was, became very popular. It became the number one selling um, uh, bourbon in Kentucky itself. And then the number one selling bourbon in New York and actually the number two selling bourbon in the world now. So it's behind Jim Beam. It's the second biggest selling bourbon in the world. We did very well over the last couple of years, thankfully, um, thanks to people drinking at home. And that is what they do with our products. As my mentor likes to say, this is what people drink at home. When you go to America, this mm -hmm. is what people buy in the off licenses and they drink in their houses. Like 11% of all bourbon that is bought in America is Evan Williams. 11% of all bourbon full stop is Evan Williams. So it's really high, high percentage considering how many brands there are out there at the moment of yeah. American whiskey, you know? Benji, just uh, about that bourbon part, you said it's a minimum of 51% uh, corn. Mm -hmm. Is there mm -hmm. also a maximum amount of corn that can be used or is that? No, uh... you, you can actually do a hundred percent. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to, um, there's nothing to say that you, that you have to be a mixture of grains. Now, we don't generally mm -hmm. because the flavor is very one directional. There's okay. not a lot of um, variants that will come if you just did a straight corn whiskey. And they never really did, even back in the 1780s, 1790s, when they would have been bringing, they would have had a transported rye, or in actuality, rye would have been used, as, or we think, as a covering crop. So they would have planted it throughout the winter to keep the, gr the ground fertile throughout the winter. Or even in between the rail, the rows of the corn itself to stop pests from getting up mm -hmm. to the corn. So they would grow it in between the rows and keep keep all the pests down at the bottom part. So they would have a little bit of rye and a lot more of corn. So that's where it would sort of come into it. But a lot of the um, distilling techniques and knowledge was based around winter grains and winter grasses like rye, because a lot of it came from Germany from um, Scotland, from Ireland, and they would have been very used to distilling with these grains. Mm -hmm. So we see it as we always have to put some kind of flavoring grain in with our whiskey. It doesn't always have to be rye, but we always have to have some type of flavoring grain in there to give it that variable, to give it that kind of depth into the whiskey. And in yeah. fact, we'll try another bourbon a little bit later on where we don't use rye as our flavoring grain, we use wheat instead. Then you'll be able to see the differences a lot more yeah these grains and stuff as well there's a couple of questions in the chat already uh, benji mm -hmm. also some really nice tasting notes from you so uh mm -hmm. get to the chat and, and read them i'm not gonna gonna read them for you but um sure. one of the questions is um a little charred wood or is that charcoal filtering giving a little smoky aroma um not it shouldn't be we don't tend to have it there's touches of smoke that comes through always generally for the, it's from the wood it's not from the charcoal part the filtration that we do which is it has minimal um touching on the charcoal itself most of it is actually chill proofing especially at this level uh, when we're looking at 43 percent what this one is or anything below that kind of 40 uh, 50 percent mark in fact we do with chill proofing and that will be the main um way that we'll be doing our filtration of our whiskies so the charcoal that we use is oak charcoal uh, and it doesn't have a huge amount of flavor that would actually go into it by that point it would actually become flavorless it'd be taking flavor out of it rather than putting any flavor into it at all, at all. yeah i've got two questions uh, involving malting in some way mm -hmm. first one is about the corn is it unmalted corn yes as far as i'm aware you can't malt corn or there's no need yeah. to malt corn anyway um mm -hmm. it, rather than you can't um it's the sugars are already available it's, it's very good for making alcohol in that way because it has a very very high sugar content it's not dissimilar to grapes uh, in its style um 
So you have a lot of residual sugars that's already there. The type of corn that we use um, is kind of a hybrid style. It looks like a bit like sweet corn. Um, it looks very much like sweet corn, but it's very, very hard. So if you were trying to bite it, it would, your teeth would fall out. It's rock solid, like stone. Um, but it means that we can mill it. So it gets milled very, very easily. And it's, and it's been cross-pollinated specifically to make whiskey out of. So that's why it's in that very, very kind of hard state. But no, we don't have to malt the corn to be able to, to do it. It's the, the sugars are already there. Yeah. And then Jean wants to know, do you always need malted barley? I guess it's the same as, as what you talked about with the rye. You can, you can use malted barley, but you can use basically any kind of grain to add flavoring. to. Uh... Yes. Yeah. We generally all use malted barley. Now, it, it, you can use other malted grains. So you could use malted rye, for instance, mm -hmm. when you were doing it. Um, it, it becomes, I believe it's something to do with the pH levels. My distillation knowledge is minuscule in relative parts to the people that I work with. Um, so when it comes to actually distilling the product uh, and or fermenting the product in that case, um, it's not my specialist subject. But we do use malted barley in all of our recipes and it is generally for the purpose of converting the enzymes across from the rye. It just speeds up the process and neutralizes the pH in the fermentation. So it's like, rye is a nightmare. If anyone's ever just fermented rye before, they'll know it's an absolute nightmare. Uh, it, it's, it will bubble over a lot. Its pH levels go off a lot. Uh, and it was also very, very sticky. So the malted barley helps control those. Mm -hmm. Maybe one last question before we mm -hmm. move on a little bit. So compared to malt and grains, per square meter, do you need less or more corn? I think mm -hmm. corn is more efficient in uh, producing, has a bigger yield in alcohol if you, if you use it. Yes, you're quite right. Yeah, the, 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 the um, corn is very, very efficient in producing, um, uh, pr pr producing actual ethanol, from its from in its conversion, it's it's very very high. In fact, it's one of the best grains to do it with. Yeah. Because, not because it has grain. such a high sugar content, it's, yeah, that you can have, you have more base product to convert into uh, alcohol. Precisely, and it does it very quickly. It, it will it will find those sugars really really quickly. All right. So cool. yeah, it is more economical, and it's also for us, obviously, being that we are in Kentucky, all of our corn comes within fifty miles of our distillery. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very localized, means it's also very fresh. Um, whereas the rye and even the, the barley have to be not always imported, but have to obviously come from the north at least. Although we are working with um, farmers in Kentucky to use rye again as a covering crop. So we're, we're, along with the University of Kentucky, we're doing a lot of investment into some of the farms around in our area to be able to produce rye but the yields are so small currently because it's a very small um winter season which you need obviously to grow rye in that the yields are tiny which means they lose the farmers are losing money because their yields are so much smaller on using rye rather than using other crops like wheat so we have to subsidize them to do it to encourage them to go and grow that rye but if, for us in the long term it will be very beneficial because hopefully we'll be able to make uh, uh, the style of um, rye bourbon, but all from Kentucky, where it's all grown in Kentucky. Because at the moment, most of our rye comes from North Dakota, but sometimes can come as far as Canada or even Europe as well, depending on on what the uh, what the harvest has been like. All right, let's get back to the presentation, shall we? So, who is this person on the right, and why is he so proudly showing that bottle to the other two guys? <laughs> so that's that's Max Shapira. That's the guy right. who emailed me just before we came on. Um, he is our CEO. He's the son um, of uh, the of David Shapira, the guy who was filling up the barrel. Uh, this is from the nineteen sixties, I think, mid nineteen sixties. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy, the guy in the chap in the middle there with the polo neck on is Parker Bean. Uh, who was our master distiller for nearly 50 years um, and is quite a legend in, in American distillation for some of the things that he did um, and how we produced. Yeah, another one of the Beam family, he's actually a son of Earl. So when Harry and Joe left, Earl came across from Jim Beam and he brought the yeast, the jug yeast along with him uh, over to Heaven Hill 
and then he passed that on to Parker, who was his son. And then his son, Cray, also became our distiller for a couple of years and still works <clears> for the company, but is no longer a massive distiller. So for 80 years of our 86-year history, we always had a Bean family member as our master distiller, but no longer. We now have an Irishman as our master distiller, uh, Connor O'Driscoll. So this is them in the 1960s. Now, Max went off and worked on Wall Street for a little bit at the end of the 50s and the start of the 60s. This product, Evan Williams, is what, like I say, is our flagship product at Heaven Hill. It's what makes us what we are. And we were very fortunate to be having a product that was doing well at a time where a lot of other American whiskey wasn't. Um, this allowed us to be in a position to purchase other brands when they weren't doing so well. And some of the whiskeys that we'll try and later were ones that we have purchased from other distilleries as they were shut down. When we go through the 20th century, as we come past that part, like I was saying, people getting into margaritas and, and Vespa martinis and things like that, um, you hit the 60s and the 70s and you have the anarchy, the hippie movement, things like that. People didn't want to drink what their dads and their granddads have been drinking in America. You know, that was seen as, as the old America that they were trying to get away from. So American whiskey really was in a pretty bad way right up until really until about 2004, 2005. But the, the building blocks for, for that to come back started in the mid 80s, but it took a long time for that to actually uh, to actually continue and get to, to where we are today. But we were in a very fortunate position that we had a successful brand in Evan Williams, which kept us afloat and made us able to acquire other brands at a time where other brands were being swallowed up. We were the ones that we were able to bring them on. And we quite often see ourselves really as, the caretakers of some American whiskey. We do it in the, you know, with the bottled in bond, we do the classic kind of style, but we keep some brands alive that would never have been around if it wasn't for the fact of us bringing them on into our portfolio and keeping them going. Things like Rittenhouse Rye, for example, mm -hmm. would have disappeared. If it wasn't for us bringing in Rittenhouse Rye, when that kind of revolution happened, you know, between 2005 and 2015, there wouldn't have been any rye to purchase <laughs> because yeah. nobody else was making it. We were the only ones making it for a very long time. Um, and the, the, it just wasn't available. And it wasn't until that kind of boom now, everyone's making a rye again. But mm. if it wasn't for that, then we wouldn't have had rye there in the first place to be able to keep up with the demand. So we were fortunate in that respect to, to be able to keep it going. So things were going well. <laughs> Yeah. Up, in, up until this. <laughs> uh, this is uh, November the 7th, 1996. Um, a, you can see these beautiful rick houses that are in the background here that, that we age all our products in. Uh, that's tin on the outside, and then the inside, it's wood. And inside of that, it's barrels full of very high strength alcohol, nothing else. Um, so when it gets hit with a beam of lightning, you're in a bit of trouble. Uh, yeah. And that's what happened to us. Or we think that's what happened, uh, an, electrical, an electrical storm. It was a very stormy day. Uh, nobody actually saw it. Nobody, thankfully, nobody was hurt or injured in the fire. Um, but unfortunately, it did run through our distillery. As you can see, it's hit one of those rickhouses there. Uh, that We lost that rickhouse in 15 minutes. Wow. So everything inside of it obviously caught on fire including all of the liquid, which then created a river of fire, which then passed on down through our distillery. Um, we lost another six rick houses, and unfortunately we lost our distillery as well. So in one day, we had the worst uh, disaster in the history of American distillation. And in that one day, we lost 2% of the world's bourbon. Not, not of ours, of the world's bourbon, we lost wow. in that day 2%. Um, we all, it was became so bad we actually set the Mississippi River on fire. So this the fire itself ran down into the Mississippi. You can look this up online if you type in Heaven Hill Fire to uh, 1996, and there's there's video footage, and you'll see. And we actually set the Mississippi River on fire. One of the things I would say about this, which is quite amazing and kind of sums up American whiskey, certainly in the 20th century, when this happened, uh, there was actually only 10 distilleries in America making American whiskey at this point in 1996. And we were one of those. So this has just happened. So there's only nine distilleries owned by seven different companies making American whiskey at that point. That's all. Today, there's 2,700 distilleries making American whiskey in America. As, as recent as 2005, it was just 10. So it's boomed a lot. But at that mm -hmm. time, there wasn't a lot going on. And 
the overall production of that year was 400,000 barrels of whiskey for the, for the, the industry as a whole. Um, put that into context, Jim Beam made 6 million barrels last year. So to mm-hmm. give you some idea of where it was. So they realized if with us having this fire and not being able to distill any more whiskey, they were going to lose another big player in the world of American whiskey. So the other brands stepped in and helped us stay afloat. They lent us um, space in their fermentation tank so we could buy the grains and go to another distillery, a Woodford Reserve or Wild Turkey or Four Roses, and we could go use their fermentation tanks. And then they would allow Parker Bean to come and oversee distillation in their stills. And then they lent us space in their rick houses to age our whiskey until it was ready. So if it wasn't for the other um, brands of American whiskey, the, the traditional old brands, Jim Beam and, like I say, Woodford for Old Forester, then we as Heaven Hill wouldn't have existed anymore. So if it wasn't for those other nine distilleries, we wouldn't be here today. And I don't really know any other industry where that's the case, where you would have that's that incredible. kind of thing to come up. To be honest, if it happened today, I don't know if it would happen either. Yeah. But, then, but then... Different yeah. world today, yeah. Exactly, yeah. It's, 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 things have got bigger. But I don't know any other industry. If, if Coca-Cola was burning, then Pepsi would be there throwing on more gas. You know, they're not yeah, going to come yeah, down yeah. And, and help. Be buying help barrels with. of whiskey to throw yeah, on. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for me, it shows up what, what American whiskey is all about. And it, it's about that sense of family, friends, sharing and being together. And that's, and that's what I love about the industry. It's what I love about the whiskey. And, and I think that, that story kind of highlights that nicely. We still use the site today to age our whiskies, as you can see. So that's the same site. Uh, we've, we've dug moats around the, the, the rick houses now. So God forbid it ha- ever happens again, there, there's a little moat and the, it can't move anywhere. So it would just be one of them. So you know, we've learned our lessons, but we're still in the same place and they're still exactly the same rick houses and nothing else has changed in that way. Um, and that's what brings us into a nice kind of bit. And that's kind of our history of where we are today. Today, we bought our um, new distillery called the Bernheim Distillery in 1999, um, which was a classic old American distillery, <clears throat> uh, but it was of a bit of a larger size. So we're able to produce a little bit more um, and has allowed us to be where we are today, which is the fourth largest spirit supplier in the US. Now, right. we have some questions on... on yeah, this, let's, do a little, let's do a little quiz uh, for the people uh, who are here, uh, you guys who are listening. Just for a bit us. of fun. Just a bit Obviously. of fun because the, the, the numbers on Heaven Hill Distillery are quite, quite amazing. Uh, and we just have a couple of questions and we'd like you to just make an educated guess and put it in the chat what you think the answer is. We'll give you a couple seconds for that and then uh, Benji will give you the right answer. So I'll be the quiz master uh, and I'll, I'll ask you the question. So the, the first one, You've seen these rick houses on the on the pictures, um, where the bourbons and rice are uh, are uh, aged. Uh, so the first question is, how many barrels do you think you can fit in one of those rick houses? So like the one you're seeing there, that's that's a rick house. How many barrels in one of those? So and just to remind you, a barrel is 200 liters uh, American standard barrel. So you all know kind of how big it is a barrel. So. Ah, there's some guesses. Get out, get, getting some answers in straight away. I like it. We've yeah, got yeah, yeah. No thinking, just putting numbers in. That's good, yeah, everybody. Yeah, no, good. I like it. Yeah. 6,000, 30,000. Okay, we've, we've got a range of about six to 30,000 uh, mm-hmm. at the moment. Any more guesses, guys? 9,000, all right. Thousands and thousands. Thousand. So covering, covering your bases there, Daniel. Pretty good. <laughs> 9,000, 30,000. 300,000. 300, okay. Natalie's going big. Mm-hmm. All right, so we've got a range of uh, 18,500, which is weirdly specific. Pretty good. So <laughs> either you Googled it or... Uh... <laughs> yeah. So we've got uh, a range of uh, between six and 300,000, uh, Benji. How much is it <clears throat> actually? Well, unfortunately, nobody got it right. Um, it's 55,000. 55,000, pretty good. 55,000 barrels that we can store in one of those brick houses. So they are seven stories high, uh, with three barrels on each story, and we can hold 55,000 of them in one rick house. So 55,000 times 200 liters, that's like a lot. I'm a not going to calculate that. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. 
but we do lose 10% of our whiskey in the first year. So, you know, a little bit less. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Vincent, you're, you're pretty ahead of, your, of the game because uh, Vincent is asking how many Rick houses in total, but that's actually mm. the next quiz question. So uh, have, a, have a little guess. How many, how many guess of those... <laughs> How many of these uh, 55,000 barrel rick houses does Heaven Hill have at the moment? It's in six different locations around Kentucky. You have seen the, the picture behind Benji there. So if you, uh, if you can focus really a little bit, you can start counting. can start counting. Yeah. There you go. Ah, lots of guesses 20, 25, 10, 9, 45, mm -hmm. 50, 55. 42. 42 is actually the answer to everything, uh, according to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That's a pretty Absolutely. good guess, uh, Michael. Yeah, like that. 65, okay. So at the moment, we're between 9 and 65. Well, 65 has got it. It's that we're actually on, I would believe at the moment, 64, but that could easily be 65 by now. Uh, we are building a new one every four months currently that's so just an incredible some, stat there some we have to replace because yeah. obviously that you know they're made from wood and sawdust and tin um so they don't that structurally they have to be replaced but yeah we build a new one every four months mm -hmm. uh, and they're all built by the same family that built them in the in the first place music so we they they specialize in making these type of Rick houses and Max um, actually went to school with the, the head of the guy from music. Uh, so he picks up a phone and starts building one every four months. So yeah, six, 64, but 65 is a damn good guess. Jason, mostly done. Yeah, so th really it's, it's March 21st now. So if you're, if you're watching this uh, in four months, it'll be 65. And in eight yes. months, it'll be 60. It could 60. already be 65, to be yeah. perfectly honest with you. I may not have <laughs> been updated on the numbers. I just saw another qu question from uh, Graham. Gazette there. Uh, yeah, Wim, Wim is asking, any reason not going for non-wood rickhouses? The, well, the reason would be that we stick to the same type of rickhouses. Um, but the, it's what happens inside them. It's what we use to our benefit at Heaven Hill. So the, um, oh, someone's figured out how many litres of stock. <laughs> There's a calculator. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, yeah, so the reason is, is because our style, our, what we would call our house style at Heaven Hill, depends very much on these music open rick houses where they are not temperature controlled um, and they're dirt floored and they allow a lot of air circulation around our barrels. Uh, Parker Beam used to say, if you don't have good air circulation, you can't make good whiskey. This is an American whiskey, of course. Uh, and it's very, very important to the style. As you can tell, we started off with the style of uh, rick houses. And that's the way that we'll continue. And we now use them to our advantage to make our products taste different from some other ones because these are very expensive to build, uh, around about $6 million to build one of these rick houses, uh, which means not all the companies use them. In fact, very few of them actually use them because you need a lot of room, you need a lot of space. Uh, and obviously they have a lot of cost and they're also very high maintenance costs as well. You need... Uh, a lot you need a crew of eight people to put barrels in them and take barrels off them so we have three crews working 24 hours they work eight hours each and they work continuously 24 hours 365 days a year and we have to do it like that in order to compete and stay at the top level but if you change that style of rickhouse you will end up inevitably changing the style of whiskey what would you say the influence of the environment yeah, is temperature I'm just going to, before you answer that, uh, mm. Benji, maybe uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll suggest that everybody pours this second whiskey and we'll try that and we'll talk yes. about it a little later on. We'll yes, it will, come, it will come up, the, um, the, uh, what actually happens in the rick houses uh, yeah. and the environment and the influence of the environment will actually cover, in, as you say, in a little bit further on. In, oh, okay, in, so we'll, we'll come back to that. So the, the next whiskey we're so going to taste the next is, whiskey for sure, yeah. is, the, is the white, which is the 100 proof, which is on your labels uh, for the sample. So. I, I, um, I read you there, Manu. I knew you were getting thirsty. So. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting ones to tell the difference now. We're now um, trying the number one bottled in Bond bourbon uh, in the world. So this was released fairly recently, back in 2011, I believe. Um, so it's quite a new product for us. Um, but it is a different style. It's not extra aged. It's four years old because it's bottled in Bond. Um, so we, we take it to that four-year mark. Well, it, it's 50% alcohol. We're going to get into 
what the differences are in the bottled and bond restrictions on the next slides, but uh, it does have a big influence on what the whiskey tastes like, particularly obviously with the proof, the age coming through into the whiskey as well. So it will taste different to Evan Williams, even though it comes from exactly the same mash bill. It all starts in the same place. It's the same distillate, mm -hmm. uh, but it ends up being different from the way that we mature and select the barrels. So, um, so there was this question on the, on the, the influence of the environment we're coming back to. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe one more quiz question. We've got a couple mm -hmm. more. Uh, um, mm, yeah, prepared, but, um, uh, Maybe a, a fun one is how many barrels of whiskey does Heaven Hill make per year? That's a pretty pretty cool one to ask, I think. So, uh, how many barrels do you think are being made per year? Two hundred thousand. Everyone's guessing that it's probably not going to be a small number. Yeah, no, I think they've heard the first numbers about the yeah, number of yeah. rick houses, and and so yeah, people are also tasting now, so not yeah, many people yeah. can do two two things at once. Five hundred k. Jos Jos is uh, just sending it to me, not to everybody, but five hundred k. He's guessing four hundred and twenty again. The forty two, but then times thousand. Very good, Michiel. <laughs> 11,000 that's quite low Jean 11,000 I think I don't know the answer to, to, be, uh, to be fair so uh, Jos Smertes is saying 750,000 305,000 again weirdly specific Jason pretty good <laughs> I like it yeah Okay, Benji, uh, save us. How many barrels a year? Daniel's about there. It's a little over 500,000 barrels of whiskey wow. per year. Half a We've million. just increased it. It actually was around 420,000, hilariously, before, um, up until about six months ago. And now we managed to squeeze out more yield. So we're not actually using more grain. We're using, but the, we've brought in a couple of people that have been working at other distilleries and we have. Uh, streamlined our process within fermentation. Again, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of it scientifically because I'm full short. But what I do know is that we have increased our production from 1,300 barrels per day to 1,500 barrels per day. And that's because of this new, new style that we've been using where we extract even more from the grains. So yeah, we're just a little over 500,000, about 520,000 barrels per year. So just to put this into perspective, that's 100 million liters a year. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Those are some big numbers there. Yeah. yeah. You should see the, how big the number is when he has to pay his tax bill every month. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's an even bigger number. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So 500,000 produced per year. Maybe one last one. Uh, mm. How many barrels uh, do you think we are currently sitting on? How many barrels are currently maturing? in all those rick houses combined. There was a big guess uh, of, of uh, Daniel earlier. That, that was in liters, not in barrels. So, oh, wow. So many zeros, Wim. Uh, mm -hmm. two, two million. Two million? Yeah, that's two million that, he, that you're guessing. Three and a half million. Yeah, I see people are getting, they're understanding now where this yeah. is going, right? Yeah. If we had start, if we, if we started with this, then it would have been a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was a good build up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 450,000. Okay. Yeah, so we, you've got three and a half million is the highest guess I can see here. So, uh... yeah, it's a bit over where we are. We are, we are the second largest holding of bourbon in the world. Mm -hmm. And we are currently have 1.9 million barrels aging across our six uh, aging warehouse sites. Yeah. And those are, of course, all American standard barrels, American oak, 200 yeah. liter barrels. Yeah. All white oak, all of them, 203 liters to be precise, 53 yeah. gallons. Yeah. 203.4, actually, I believe it is, a four barrel. Mm -hmm. But yeah, 1.9 million. We have the most stock over the age of eight years of bourbon in the world mm -hmm. yeah 
So there's quite a quite a big uh, turnover then, because if you're making half a million a year, you've got 1.9 million maturing. So you've got mm-hmm. you're basically replacing all your stock every three or four years. Yeah, it, like yeah, that. it increase. Yeah, it increases. The, the I mean, the stock holding since I started it goes up around about two hundred thousand barrels a year. Mm-hmm. Currently, I'd say at the way we're producing with uh, what we use and what it goes, but those numbers are increasing every year. So we have to produce more whiskey and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a fine balancing act of knowing what's going to happen. Even with our entry level products is five years. Mm. We have to think five years ahead. The bourbon industry is different to what it was five years ago still yep. now. So, you know, even just making our entry level products, it takes some forethought of not only where we will be, but also where the industry will be. Obviously, how can you plan for the last two years? You, I mean, we can't, obviously, and, and who knows what's going to happen going forward from here. So mm-hmm. it makes everything a very difficult balancing act, uh, but one that obviously we've got a lot better at over the years and um, with some smart investments uh, into other areas of, whisk, uh, of alcohol. So we're not as dependent just on the whiskies anymore, mm-hmm. which I'll touch on in a little bit. Manu just asked there, and we can use the, the barrel one time. Yes, that is correct. For bourbon and rye whiskey, we can only use the barrel or wheat whiskey, which is another one that we make. We are only allowed to use the barrel once. It's a very um, significant style of American whiskey is that we use our barrel, we can only use our barrels one time. Um, but once we're done with them, we actually, one of the products that we're going to try in a bit, actually, um, you must use a once use barrel. So you, it, it's different from bourbon and rye. Okay. So some of it goes to that, uh, but generally we sell them either on the open market or to, we have a tequila brand as well called Luna Azul, and they use our barrels to age the Reposado in the, in the Echo of those. Uh, we also have a uh, American brandy called Christian Brothers, which use our barrels as well after. Plus we have a very strong market in um uh flavored whiskies as well so we'll use a lot of our barrels again in those as well as selling them to scotch tequila rums you know anything else that's in the, that's in the barrel somewhere along the line so we, we we get the use out of them they cost around about 140 dollars for us to purchase and we'll sell them for about 130 120 dollars yeah. in the open market or we used to before the pandemic yeah <laughs> all right let's uh have a look at the next slide, I think, because we're going to see somebody we met before. Yeah, oh, indeed, there he is. There he is again. A little bit, a little bit wiser now. Yes. Um, that's his daughter. So we are actually the third generation onto it now. And as I've said already, I think I've said all these points. Largest family-owned and operated producer of distilled spirits in America. The fourth largest supplier in the U.S. The second largest holder of even infantry of bourbon in the world. And we are the largest single site bourbon distillery in the US or in the world because you can only make bourbon in America. Um, worth noting there, there's two distilleries that are bigger than us, Jim Beam, but they are spread across two distilleries. They have a distillery in uh, Chicago as well as one in Kentucky. Uh, and of course, Jack Daniels, which is the largest American whiskey, but they are not technically a bourbon, so don't fall into that category. Although... Uh, Jack Daniels is larger than the bourbon industry and rye industry combined. <laughs> just to give it some scale with just yeah. how big Jack Daniels is. Um, whether that means better, I'll leave it for you to decide. So this is the one we're trying right now. This is what we're trying now. Exactly the same again with the mash bill, as I said before. This is what we call our HH Reg or Heaven Hill Regular Mash Bill. It's what we make 90% of the time. We are unusual for um, um, one of the large producers in America in the fact that we actually make five different types of American whiskey. Most will only make one, possibly two. You know, you'll get a bourbon, maybe a rye. But we make bourbon, wheated bourbon, rye, wheat whiskey, and corn whiskey. So we make five different types of American whiskey, and we're the only one of the larger distilleries that does that. Mm -hmm. But the recipe that we make 90% of the time is our Heaven Hill regular recipe because it goes into more of our products than any others. We can change our products on how and where they are aged in these rick houses, which I'll get onto in a little bit. But that's how we start separating out some of our brands and making different brands, but from the same liquid. 
to start with. So this is a bottled and bond whiskey, so it's probably best I break down what yeah. bottled and bond is. So this is the oldest consumer regulation in America, full stop. Um, this was the very first consumer protection law that came in on March the 3rd, 1897. Nine years before they had any other consumer protection laws on drugs or other liquors or food or anything like that. Nine years before that, they sorted out their bourbon. That's how important it was to the culture of Americans. Uh, whiskey was such a big thing and they had to find a way of differentiating the good stuff, as I called it before, mm -hmm. from this other style of whiskey that was being made at the end of the 19th century. Now, in those days, this is not long after we started putting stuff into a bottle, um, you could just write whiskey on the label and it didn't have to you didn't have to go to all the, the regulations that we do now or what the bottle and bond ones were. So you could just have neutral grain spirit that would have been flavoured with teas or beers, if you're lucky. If you're unlucky, then tobacco spit and leather bootstraps and um, <laughs> awful, awful things, battery acids and all sorts of kinds of stuff. And you could still sell it as whiskey. There was no law to separate the two out. So a guy called John Carlyle, who was the um uh was the guy in congress from kentucky lobbied by a guy called colonel eh taylor who was a very famous uh original bourbon um maker and distiller and builder in fact he built the um uh the ofc distillery which is now buffalo trace he built that <clears throat> and some other distilleries as well and he was the one that was pushing for this bit of legislation to come in now this did a couple of different things one it put his whiskey under bond. So these rick houses would be watched by a federal agent at our costs, at the cost of the distillery. They would watch the rick houses and make sure that nobody could go in or out of those rick houses at the start of the end of the day and alter what was going on with those whiskey. So this is putting it under bond. What this did was it deferred our tax payments. So when we first started making our whiskeys back in, this, in these times, we were in a very religious area of America, the Bible Belt. Uh, very Catholic and, and um, uh, evangelical side of, of religion. And they're not particularly big on alcohol, if we're being honest. So when we put our whiskey into those barrels, they would start char charging us uh, tax on the very first day that our whiskey went in. Now, yourselves might be familiar with the, of the angel share that we get, particularly high in America. Uh, obviously, because we have big temperature fluctuations, it can get very hot over there. So we lose 10% of our whiskey in the first year to the angel share. So I'm coming down and taking their share for the heavens or evaporation, as we like to call it nowadays. And uh, we lose three or 4% of that year on year after. So after four years, we've lost around about 25% of our product that was in there at the start. Now we would have had to pay tax on that product pre the bottled and bond thing. So this is the way of de deferring the payments until after the whiskey was matured. So it gave us time and we weren't going to lose out and I think by aging our whiskey to the, what we saw as the correct length. The way that, that we would pay that tax then is they would take the whiskey out. They could only reduce the uh, liquid by pure water, so they can't add anything else to it. And they could filter it through, with charcoal filtration, but they would take it down to exactly 100 proof or 50% alcohol as we would see it here in, in Europe. In those days, they did it by proof. So we would pay tax on a hundred proof gallon. So every gallon that came out would be reduced down to 100 proof alcohol. And that's what we would pay our tax on, which is why bottled in bond is always 50% alcohol because it was a hundred proof. And that's how you paid your tax relative on there. So we had to be produced by the same distiller in the same distilling season at the same distillery. And then we would have to write on the label itself, our unique, D, uh, DSP number, which is our distilled spirit producer number, or distilled spirit plant number. This shows where we produced our whiskeys, mm -hmm. and they're all relevant to that. Us at Heaven Hill have the DSP KY for Kentucky, number one, because we're the best. So we have DSP KY number one. Uh, and we also have DSP KY number 31, which is our bottling plant where we do it. And we have to put both of those on the label to show people where the, where the whiskey has been made and who it's been made by. The distilling seasons, there's two different distilling seasons in America, um, January through to June and July through until December. So we have a little 
break in the middle, but that's why we sometimes at Heaven Hill, we release stuff uh, as a spring and a fall version because that's what we call the distilling season. So it's a spring di uh, distilling season and a fall distilling se season. Um, and then, as I said, four years in oak containers, that's the minimum. When they first bought in this in 1897, that was as far as you could take it. Four years old was as long as you could take it. After the Second World War, when we started overproducing, they stretched that and the bottled in bond uh, limitation was actually taken up to 20 years eventually. So you could be there for 20, you could hold that stock for 20 years uh, under bottled in bond. Um, and as I say, we can't alter it from any, anything else with filtration or, or chill proofing uh, or any other treatments, so no colorings or anything like that. Uh, and we can't miss class the spirits. So we couldn't, uh, we couldn't mix a bourbon with a rye or corn whiskey with a, with a bourbon or so on and so forth. It has to be the same class of spirits. And that's what we stick to today. That's what we still make a lot of. As I say, Evan Williams is the number one selling bottled in bond um, in the world now. Uh, it's a very interesting whiskey. I like the kind of its power, I would say, I think, with this whiskey. Uh, it's kind of, this isn't, this isn't the kind of <clears throat> the best thing about this whiskey. I think is it's it's not a bit like the whiskey they were drinking in 1897. This is exactly like the whiskey they were drinking in 1897. There is no real difference. When this law came in, the bottled and bomb whiskey that Colonel E. H. Taylor and James E. Pepper and people like that were making, this is exactly the same whiskey. It's still the exactly the same proof. It's been aged for exactly the same amount of time, and it's unaltered in the same way. So this is really what bourbon was that gave it its name to where it is today. It all comes from this. And that's what I love about this. It is a very genuine style. This takes you back. If we are drinking a, a scotch or even things like gins and vodkas, they're not like what they were 125 years ago. But with bottled and bond bourbon, it, with this one in particular, this is exactly what they were drinking back in 1897. Yeah, that's pretty cool to think of. Yeah. So let's try another bottled and bond. Yeah, but something completely different. Yeah, completely different. That's why I kind of wanted to show you. This is how we can show that this will go into the next part that we're going to talk about, which is how we can change things and um, uh, uh, while while staying within those regulations, those very strict regulations, how we can actually change things around. So now we're going to try mellow corn. Now mellow corn isn't a bourbon or a rye. This is a corn whiskey. This actually predates bourbon in its style. What we're going to be drinking with the, the corn whiskey, as you can see on the graphic there, is a little bit higher in its corn um, ratio. That's because corn whiskey, to be called corn whiskey, has to be at least 80% corn in the mash bill. So bourbon's 51%, rye has to be 51% rye, and corn whiskey has to be at least 80% corn in the mash bill. So this, again, this separates it out slightly from what bourbon is and what rye is. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot more corn in there, so you're going to get a lot more of those flavours coming through. But what you'll notice with the colour of this, particularly in, in reference to the last whiskies that we tried and what we're trying later, it's a lot lighter. It's a lot more of a kind of straw kind of colour to the whisky itself. Now, there's a very good reason for that. Because we're a corn whisky, we are not allowed to be aged in brand new barrels. This is where it differs from rye and from, um, from bourbon. Now, the, the, where this comes from, this is the, these are called Kentucky longboats. This is what they use to ship bourbon from Bourbon County down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi River, eventually ending up in New Orleans. Okay, this is the first style of transportation before we had railroads and, and, and freights and all those kind of things. This is the way that you would transport goods around. And barrels were those first type of shipping containers. So this is like a rickhouse. That journey that would, from Bourbon County down to New Orleans. So there's a little um, waterfall on the Ohio River called the Ohio Falls, right? And if you had a ship like this and you hit that waterfall, it's, about, it's not very like, big, um, but it is a nightmare to get through. You would have had to disembark off your boat, taken everything out and carried your boat around to the other side of the waterfall. And then from there, you had a straight run all the way down to New Orleans. So what they did was they started all of the things there. So that's where everyone, that's where the port first came to. Everybody would come to Bourbon County to start. And that's where you would have 
barrel shops and um, shipbuilders and all those kind of things there because that's where you would start that journey. So they would take these barrels and they would have used them for many different things or you would have got to bought a brand new barrel and put your whiskey in it. But if you bought got a barrel that had been used for something else, it could have been used for crayfish or clams or flowers or sugars, there, there would be some residual um, flavour from what had ever been in that barrel before. So what they did was they burnt the inside of the barrels to get rid of the bacteria and the flavours of those uh, what's been in there before. Then we load up these barrels, they take them all the way down the Mississippi River, and that journey takes between six and nine months. So you're going through two or three pretty distinct seasons. So this is where that barometric pressure, as you can see, there's no there's no roof or anything like that. So all of that ambient temperature will be affecting the whiskey. So when they got down to New Orleans, they opened up the whiskey, they realized that it started to change color. Before that, the whiskey was completely clear. When they put it in in, in Kentucky, and the style of whiskey that Johan Beam and Basil Hayden and Evan Williams and Elijah Craig were making back in the 1780s, 1790s, was completely clear. It had no aging to it whatsoever. The aging came when they started this process of transportation going down the Mississippi River down to New Orleans in the 1815s, the 1820s. And when they got to the other end, they took the, uh, the liquor out and they noticed it started to change color. And they used to call it the red liquor from Kentucky. And that is because it's starting to change into that kind of reddish kind of way. Now, it would have been high corn whiskey. They wouldn't have been using as much rye in those days, hence the high amount of corn in the mash bills. Um, but most importantly, the, to represent the barrels and what they would have done in the aging, if we use a, we can use a brand new barrel, but we're not allowed to burn the inside of that barrel. Because if you bought a new barrel in those days, you wouldn't have burned the inside because you wouldn't have used it for something else. So there's no need to burn the inside of the barrel. So the representation of what happens in the barrels is a representation of what they did at that time due to the transportation. So we can put it in a brand new barrel and not burn the inside, but it's kind of pointless. It's never going to do much to the whiskey itself. Or you can use the barrel once for something else. In our case, we use it for Evan Williams and then we use it for Mellow Corn. But the, the difference that you see in that color, that lighter style, is because we have already extracted lots of sugars, lots of flavors in the first using of that barrel. Mm -hmm. And then on the first fill, it will change its makeup and we're not extracting as much flavors coming out. Which, because it's a four-year-old whiskey that hasn't got these big new oak flavors coming through, the grain actually starts to come through a lot more in the taste and in the nose, and you should get a lot more of those corn flavors essentially coming through, the sweetness, the butteriness and stuff. I haven't looked at the chat, but... Yeah, you, you, know, always, but. you always put a, a tasting note there that actually hints at that. It's got much more of that big, fat liquid bourbon popcorn. character, li mm -hmm. liquid popcorn, Yeah. Uh, some vegetable qualities, and he also says yes. uh, lots yeah. of spice. I'll bet this would taste amazing with gumbo or some other swamp food. Definitely. Uh, yes, absolutely. Really well put, actually. Yeah, and it, it, you're, you're exactly right. That got that kind of uh, the medicinal uh, mezcal production, or you could look at um, like high ester rum as well, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Blanco rums, um, things like that. We actually make Georgia Moon, which is um, this same product, but unaged. And that literally tastes like a, a white rum to me. It's got really, really high mm. kind of esters that come from the fermentation before it's aged. Um, but they still remain in this one. You, you do get that. Obviously, it's got 50% alcohol, so you're still getting those kind of ethanol notes coming through. But you have a lot more flavor coming from that. The, the, the barrel is not taking, not overpowering some of those flavors the way it does when you're talking about bourbon and rice because we use brand new barrels, which, again, we'll get into in a minute. But, yeah, that's a really good note. I really like that, that kind of style, liquid popcorn. It's, it's really well respected by bartenders this product mm -hmm. for some reason it's, it's kind of taken off over the last five years or so um it's very <laughs> corny in its bottle <laughs> the way it looks you know we haven't changed the label since so this is one of the brands that we purchased at heaven hill um you can in fact that little uh, right by your finger there there's a there's a little logo the m logo yeah that one so that's the medley brothers who originally made mellow corn and if you'll see right at the very bottom of that label, you won't be able to read it from here, but right at the bottom, you'll see it's trademarks in 1945. And that's when that, when that label and bottle was developed and we haven't changed it 
since 1945. So it's got that very classic Americana kind of style to it. And it really does stand out in a world of where everything's changed. All markets have changed in, in their whiskies. And that one clearly hasn't. And that's I why guess I kind of love it. The label for a straight corn whiskey should look corny. Right. Yeah. But something completely different, I think. Yeah. I think you can taste the, the style of it. It's not for everyone. We don't expect everybody to like every single one of our products. If we did, then why would we make five different ones as mm -hmm. the base for that? We, we make different things with different palettes and different things at different times as well. Uh, Mellow Corn for me is a much lighter product. I can use it in different ways that I don't use bourbon and rice. When I make cocktails out of it, works really well in like Palomas and things like that. You were saying with a mezcal kind of style, you know, you can mm. do more like tequila kind of drinks with it, like a Reposado style drink. Even gin drinks as well works really well with Mellow Corn, like Aviations and, you know, uh, Rickies and things like that. It takes citrus well, takes um, uh, floral notes really well. It does different things to what, bourbon and rye does because we mm. don't get those big caramel heavy vanilla kind of flavors coming through in the same way as what we do with the, with the other whiskeys so benji benji i i'm i have to i'm i have to be the bad guy here and uh mm. i need to keep an eye on timing because uh yeah. we're, we're, always we're, do this this, uh, this uh, <laughs> yeah you're 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 your, all your explanations are so interesting and I could just keep <laughs> listening to them, but it's already quarter past nine. So we should uh, really keep an eye on, uh, on yeah, uh, absolutely. what we're I'll tasting. So. Don't worry. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get three whiskeys done in 15 minutes. You That's got... perfect. We can do that. <laughs> we can absolutely can. <laughs> okay, so this is how we make the difference to our whiskeys. We have to stay very... Uh, we are very confined in what we can do in American whiskey. Right? We're not allowed to... We're not allowed to uh, to still higher than 80% alcohol. We're not allowed to put it in a barrel above 62.5% alcohol. We're not allowed to sell it less than 40% alcohol. We must use brand new barrels. Um, we're not allowed to alter that in any way or any flavorings or colorings, and we must age it for a minimum of two years, and if it's on a four, then we must write on the label. So we are pretty restricted. That's not like Scotch and Irish whiskey that can do finishes and all these different things. To be a straight bourbon, we only have so much we can play with. And this is how we can change how we play with our whiskies. So if we have exactly the same whiskey that was made with the same distillations, let's say a copper pot still, uh, that was aged in the same rickhouse for the same amount of years, that was the same proof in the, um, uh, in the whiskey, but all we changed was the yeast strain at the start of it, they would taste about 10% different. Does that make sense? If we change the distillation technique, so if we use copper still or we used a column still or a combination of the both, then we could change it by about 15%. If we change the fermentation and the small grains, i.e. the mash bills and stuff like that, then we can change it by about 25%. And then maturation aging is the biggest chunk that we can change it, and that's 50%. The longer that we leave it, the more that maturation and aging will take over, and the less of those other things will become a factor. So if we're going to age our product for 20 years, the difference in the yeast strain is going to be tiny. Do you see what I mean? It will get a much, much, it's a sliding scale. It gets much, much bigger as we go through. So this is a style of yeast that we use. Like I say, it's a jug yeast. That's what we use, at, um, the same as Jim Beam. So we have that same starting point as what Jim Beam does. But everything else that we do is very different. We use a column still. Uh, that's our column still on the right-hand side. We use 100% column still in our distillation. Although that pot still is actually at one of our other um, uh, bourbon experience in downtown Kentucky, uh, Louisville, where you, we make one barrel of whiskey per day uh, mm -hmm. on that on that uh, copper pot still, and you can go and you can see the whole process from start to finish and buy a bottle and all this kind of stuff. Uh, if you're ever in uh, Louisville, I highly recommend going down there. It's got a nice restaurant and bar and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, mm -hmm. So we have that as well, and that's another way that we can change our whiskeys. Woodford Reserve, for instance, do it in that way. Let's move on to that other whiskey. And this is going to show you how we can change things by the fermentation and small grains. So this is the what we're looking at here is the 25% 25, 25 change difference. Okay, fermentation and small grains. The reason being is this is not a rye bourbon like we had with Evan Williams and what we'll try with Elijah Craig. This is a wheated bourbon. So this is where we use wheat instead of the rye as the flavoring grain. So as you can see here, we use more wheat than what we do with rye. In fact, we use twice as much wheat, uh, wheat than what we do with rye because wheat is a much softer grain than what rye is. There's not as much big flavor that comes through it. 
we have to allow more time to age the product generally as well because you need to because those grains aren't as strong we need more flavor to come from the barrel which is why generally wheated bourbons aren't made as much because you've got to age them for a lot longer to get those kind of flavors coming through so realistically there aren't that many big wheated bourbons makers mark is the exception to the rule uh pappy van winkle is probably the most renowned one um but uh, lastly old fitzgerald this is a style of uh, wheated bourbon as well, uh, and it's where you have to go that little bit further with it to be able to taste it. So now what you're going to taste, this in comparison to Evan Williams, is the difference in the grain. This is that 25% difference that I was talking about, and hopefully when you try this, you should be able to actually get that across on the palate. I was just reading the back label there, Benji. Maybe I should just read it for, for everybody because they don't have the bottle at home. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty fun. So John E. Fitzgerald's weakness was fine bourbon and he faced temptation every day. As a treasury agent with the only set of keys to the rickhouses, taking from barrels was easy. But he didn't just take from any barrels. He took from the best barrels. Some say he was a thief. Others claim he was a man of great taste. This is the legend of larceny. Unlock the smoothness and decide for yourself. So... That's a good story, right? Yeah. So when we bought the brand, when we bought Bernheim in 1999, we also bought a brand called Old Fitzgerald, which was <clears> made by the Stitzel Weller Company, Pappy Van Winkle's personal favorite bourbon. Um, and we thought Old Fitzgerald was named in honor of a distiller, the same as Basil Hayden or Elijah Craig or Evan Williams is. Um, but it was actually Pappy Van Winkle's daughter who wrote in her book, the, the story about who John E. Fitzgerald was, and he was one of those treasury agents. He was one of the guys that was the bottled in bond that would watch the rickhouses and make sure nobody tampered with it. And ironically, <laughs> and he worked for the FBI, ironically, he stole all the whiskey, which is why the bottle <laughs> is in a, it's in a, in a lock shape, and we have the key, and you can't, it show, yeah, you can see it there, there's the lock and there's the key sort of going through the whiskey as well. Uh, but it is a lovely story. I really, I do enjoy that one. Um, but yeah, so that, that's where the uh, that's where the story comes from. So now we're going to go a bit more into the aging. As I said, I'm going to fly through these whiskeys in 15 minutes. I'm determined to do it now. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk a bit more about the aging and what happens in those rickhouses. We brought it up a little bit earlier. We age all of our whiskeys in a um, char three barrel so you can go up to about five is your maximum it used to be four five is kind of your maximum now charring that's, is different that's what they point. call alligator right Benji? that's right yeah the type four is an alligator char because it looks like an alligator skin mm -hmm. you can see it down there it's kind of you know mottled or whatever we do it to type three this is about 40 seconds now this is charring not toasting this is very very intense heat on the inside of the barrel um, which goes on for about 40 seconds, sets fire to the inside of the barrel. And this creates that level of carbon on the outside, which will filter some of the, um, the flavors that we get from fermentation distillation, take them off. And it will create the layer behind called the red layer. This is where we get all our flavor and all our color from. So we have a nice amount of, of carbon there at the layer three, which means it's good to age it that bit longer. If we were going to age it for a very short period of time, then we would actually do a much less uh, char level because we would want all that flavor. It would create a larger red layer and it would get more flavor. And if we were going to age it for ages and ages and ages, we would want it a much higher char level because then we've got a much thicker layer of carbon to take out some of those unwanted things. So as you can see, that's the layer. That's how our barrels look on the inside there. That's the layer underneath the red layer. It's coming through on the on the thing there and as we enter our whiskies into the barrels wherever it is that we put them in our rick houses the barometric pressure in the summer when it's hot will force the whiskey through the carbon taking off some of those harsher edges into the red layer and that red layer is then breaking down large molecules within the white oak which will then create different substrands that create flavor so we have five major uh, molecular compounds that are, in, that are present in white oak, which is hemicellulose, cellulose, lignin, lactone, and tannin. And that's the order they come out. So hemicellulose, one to two years. Cellulose is three, four, five years. Lignin is six, seven, eight years. Lactone, nine, 10, 11, 12 years. Tannin, 
kind of all of those and then gets more and more and more and more the longer that you leave it in there. So those different five molecules, as they get broken down by the alcohol and the water, as they hit them, will go down into longer strands, which create flavor. And we can create over, over 200 different flavors just by those strands breaking down at different rates and creating different flavor. The longer we leave it, the more the tannin will take over and the less and less that we get of the other things. So that's why we're a product that you taste at four years old by Evan Williams White is different to a product like Evan Williams Black because it's an average age of five or six years. So Evan Williams Black is getting more of the lignin coming out, which is very high in vanillins, which gives us a big vanilla-y kind of flavor to the liquid itself. In fact, lignin comes out beautifully at seven years bang on. That's the, the, when you get those big vanilla bombs. Now, I've already talked about the music open rick houses, high costs, what they're good for, extreme hot and cold temperatures. We have about 700 windows in each of those. Uh, our temperature control is that we open them in March and we shut them in October. That is our temperature control and that will allow all that air to circulate around our barrels. So now let's try a whiskey that's bang on seven years old so we can see just what that lignin does. Yeah, so the single barrel is next. Just want to point out that your, our house poet has written some tasting notes in the chat again. So uh, pretty pretty nice to, tasting notes too. So check that like out. The last name, great, good stuff. Yeah. And Lots more subdued. Yes, it is much more subdued. It is definitely softer. It allows the flavor of the barrels to come through more than the flour and the, more than the flavor of the grain. I think that's probably the main thing that you get from it. And you'll notice this more. And sometimes they, I find they come across a little bit sweeter in their style because we're using first time barrels now because obviously with this is bourbon, not corn whiskey. So we're using brand new barrels. When we do that charring on the inside of the barrel, we caramelize the sugar that's been left in the tree itself. So the sap that's been given it is life. When we, when we burn the barrels itself, that caramelizes. And because we have the first access to those sugars, they come through. And this is why American whiskey is sweeter than other styles of whiskey. Because we have corn generally as a base, but mostly because it's a brand new barrel every single time that we use it. And that means there's going to be, we have the first access to those sugars in the barrels itself. So that's why it comes through a little bit. And if we have something with wheat as the secondary grain, as opposed to rye, that will allow those sugars to come through because the flavor of the barrels are coming through more than the flavor of the grains, which makes the, the whiskey itself taste a little sweeter, softer, smoother, depending on what your inclination is. Does that make sense? No, the, the, yeah. Now, the, this, mm. the next whiskey here, the Evan Williams Single Barrel, uh, Benji, mm -hmm. I have to confess, is one of the... It's, it's, actually, it's actually, I think, the bourbon that uh, that convinced me that it was worth checking out American whiskeys. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was this uh, huge Scotch whiskey nerd a uh, long time ago. I still am. But, um, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But this was one of the... When I tasted this for the first time, it was like, okay... Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, look out for some more American stuff too, because this is yeah, and pretty, this is pretty what, darn good. Yeah, and this is one of uh, the world's only vintage dated single barrel bourbon. Yeah. Um, I think there might be some others now, if I'm being perfectly honest, but we're certainly the first. Uh, and you're in good company because this is Parker Bean's favorite whiskey as well. And it is it's uniquely selected. I think that's the main thing with this whiskey. It's not just plucked out at seven years. It's, it's uniquely se uh, selected. So this is really when we're going into what I see as classic American whiskey style flavors. It's, it's bottled at 43.3, which means the flavor is coming through nice and, and, and subtly. It's not a big in your face kind of uh, flavors, but it is coming through delight, like in a really uh, beautiful way with those kind of, like I say, it's, this is where the lignin has been broken down. So we're getting into that lovely kind of caramel vanilla flavor which i just find very distinctly american whiskey style mm. i think yeah and absolutely. uh yeah it's great i, I love it this is also uh, a whiskey that i use when i do um whiskey tastings and pair it with uh, chocolate this is yeah. one i love to pair with chocolate well this is uh, this is the thing so lignin which is very very high in vanillins which produce vanilla flavors so you're hitting it exactly the right time someone said this tasted like a galaxy caramel to me the other day and it has it has those kind of chocolate notes that come through into it 
is that, or certainly where you add chocolate to it, it can create almost goes into like white chocolate kind of style and it, mm -hmm. it, it will really play on the chocolate. You can use different types of chocolate, actually. I mm -hmm. think you're quite, quite right. You can use quite a few different styles, even stuff like white chocolate, where we'd normally go in that, you know, big, rich, cacao, heavy chocolate. It will actually work really well with the, with the really light stuff as well. Um, it, yeah. it was really, really soft and, and subtle with the way it comes through. And it, like I say, it's, it's hand-picked. So, you know, it, we will get variants within the barrels um you know because where if we have a barrel that's right next to a window we'll have another 50 that aren't so we, we we're able to select what's working well for that whiskey do you know what i mean so that we can choose them from the different areas as we go into the rick houses which is what i'll show you here so this is a cross section of one of our rick houses <clears throat> um we have 10 to 15 degrees difference between the top and the bottom on a hot day. Um, not lots cooler and more moist on the lower floors, much drier and hotter. Obviously, hot air rises that's, on the top floors. Benji, that, that's uh, degrees degrees Celsius? Just to be clear, or Fahrenheit? Yes, that, that's the, no, that's degrees Celsius. Strangely, because okay. this is an American presentation, they always do it at Fahrenheit, but it's, uh, <laughs> it is actually Celsius. Yeah, it's a okay. huge temperature fluctuation that you get from the top to the bottom. Um, because it has its almost its, its own microclimate within there, you know, because of the wood and everything else, and it gets very, very hot. Kentucky is really good for aging whiskey because we have as many hot days as we have cold days, so it's, it balances it out really well, which is why we age roughly about twice as fast as what you do in Scotland because Scotland never has a hot bit, so we age roughly about twice as fast. We have something unique with our whiskies, and when we put our um, barrels on the higher we take the same barrel of whiskey and we put it on our top tier right at the very top there uh, and leave it for um 10 year, uh, 10 15 years the proof will actually go up of the barrel so we will go from being 62.5 percent which is where we fill our barrels the maximum you're allowed to fill it at which is 62.5 percent we can actually go up to 80 percent alcohol on that top tier because the barometric pressure gets so fierce inside the barrel that it forces water molecules out through the grains of the wood. So we're not losing ethanol because ethanol is a more complicated and longer strand than what water is. Obviously, water is quite a H2O. It's quite a simple molecule. And it's also positively charged, so it grabs other water molecules. And that barometric pressure inside the barrel on a hot day gets so extreme that it can force out the water from the barrel. So we lose volume is in overall volume but we actually gain alcohol <laughs> very very weird so we go from six over 10 15 years we can go from 62.5 percent alcohol up to 80 percent alcohol it's a if miracle take, yeah it's crazy right <laughs> if we take that same barrel and leave it on the bottom tier for the same amount of time we will have less on the volume but our alcohol volume will go from 62.5 down to about 50 because where it's cooler, more damp, this allows the water molecules to bleed in through the barrel and it will just drop and settle into the barrel. So the alcohol um, content will actually go down. And this is how we can make different brands using the same mash bills. Going back to that 50% maturation where we can make the differences, if we have that much difference between the top and the bottom, you can see just how we are able to make different types of American whiskey and different liquids purely by where we age them, the selection of those barrels and the proof of that whiskey. And that's how we change our brands around from each other. We don't necessarily make loads of different mash bills and age them in different styles of rickhouses. We actually take them from different places around the rickhouses to be able to create different whiskies. And this is the inside. This is what it looks like on the inside of, of one of those rickhouses. You can see there's nothing else there and plenty of room for the air to rotate around those whiskies. So, uh, should we try the last one now? Yeah, let, let's just pour the Elijah Craig, but there's an interesting question from Michiel in the in the chat. Mm -hmm. Is the single barrel always selected from the same warehouse and also level in the rig house? Because it seems impossible to, to no. sample these casks in these warehouses. No, we, we, we they come from all over, actually. From what They'll come from one of our many... Um, ones, which everyone's are doing well. So they get they get earmarked. <clears throat> we won't taste the barrels at all for the first four years uh, because there's no point because we don't make any whiskey that's less than four years old. 
once it gets to that point, it will either get marked and it will start to go uh, earmarked to being Evan Williams white or Evan Williams black. And generally those are coming from the top tier of our rickhouse because we want as much interaction with those as possible. But we might start noticing the ones that are doing a little bit differently, perhaps, or you know, aging in a slightly different way, different flavor profiles coming off, and we'll just leave them. And eventually they may end up becoming a single barrel, or they could then end up being part made of Elijah Craig small batch, or they could continue on past that and end up being an Elijah Craig single barrel 18 year or 23 year further down the road. Those generally will be from the bottom tier, those much longer aged ones, obviously. But we don't have a set place that we take them from. We don't have a set uh, floor that we take them from either. They will generally be the middle tier, for certainly for Elijah Craig small batch. Most of the Evan Williams single barrel tends to be the middle tier that we take it from because we don't get those big fluctuations. It stays about the same. Very good for aging it for 8 to 12 years like we do with Elijah Craig small batch. Again, this is exactly the same distillate as Evan Williams black, Evan Williams white. It's just a different, we've aged them in different places and select them differently. We have a tasting panel of three people <laughs> and one person, Tawny, is pretty much responsible for every single bit of liquid we produce at Heaven Hill. So she tastes everything um, unbelievably and she does it all by her nose. She tastes nearly 300 products per day. Wow. Uh, she has the most incredible nose that was identified about 20 years ago. She can identify Evan Williams Black from about there, from her nose. Her what, was nose that was that the lady thing. in the picture a bit bit earlier on in the presentation? Uh, no, I don't think we've got a picture of Tawny. I'm not too sure if that was that would have been, but no, it's not her. But she is amazing, and she tastes everything that we make. So these are the these are the, the different sites that we have of our Rick houses. So you can see that some have quite slightly different styles. The one in the middle bottom there, the Bernheim ones, which, as you can see, are brick rick houses. We don't use those for our straight bourbon whiskies. That's where we'll maybe age our brandies or our flavoured whiskies. Deetsville, and the one at the top left, is that kind of classic rick house style. It's the one that you have behind you in the, in, in the background there. Um, that was uh, Parker Beam's favourite place. So Parker Beam's favourite whisky was Evan Williams' Single Barrel he would often go to Deepfield to select it. He thought that's where the best whiskies were being made, but that was his own personal choice. Cox's Creek is where we're building most of our new back houses now. Um, and we, the whiskey that's coming out of there is amazing, but it's young. It's only about four or five years old. So we're still waiting for those whiskies to come to maturation. Uh, Glencoe's a lot smaller. Some of these other ones are ones that we purchased when we bought other brands and they came along with these rick houses. But Cox's Creek is where we are currently building more. And then the main campus, as you can see down on the bottom left there, where we still have uh, five rick house, uh, 10 rick houses keeping our products. These are the whiskies that we make at Heaven Hill. As you can see, there's one or two on there. Um, so we also have Evan Williams 1783, which is a small batch, which is an old picture. Uh, Fighting Cock Bourbon, Rittenhouse Rye, That's also, Pipes also, Rye. Fighting Cock is also an old favourite of mine. Yeah, yeah, classic. Great old brand. Uh, 103 yeah. three proof, six year old whiskey. Yeah. Basically, there to be. We have, a, we have a saying at, at Heaven Hill that we do things stronger and longer than our competitors. <laughs> there, there's a reason for that. We create brands that uh, can be similar in style to other ones, but when we make them, we age them longer and then we put them in the bottle stronger. Mm -hmm. Fighting Cock is a good representation. That's Wild Turkey 101, but with a little bit extra, with 1% more alcohol and two yeah. years more aging. Larceny is one year older than Maker's Mark, and 1% more alcohol. So we go that little bit further than our competitors. Very, it's very awesome. American. Very American of you. Very Just... American. We're, we're Amer <laughs> American right down to our heart. Uh, and then you can see down at the bottom right-hand side there, that's the old Fitzgerald, and that's Parker's, actually, who was named in, uh, who's done in honour of um, Parker Beam. And here's some of the other products that we also make, as well as the whiskies. As I said, we do, we have diversified our portfolio because, we can't just be all whiskey nowadays um, because, as we've seen, um, American whiskey is a fickle beast. So we, we, American whiskey actually only accounts for 43% of our output. We also make Luna Azul tequila, Irish mist, um, Irish whiskey, which is sweetened with honey, 
Carolan's um, uh, Irish um, cream liqueur, which is like Bailey's, but delicious. Um, Domaine de Canton, which is a really lovely um, French ginger and vanilla liqueur. Palmer uh, pomegranate liqueur as well, which is made from fresh pomegranate juice. Blue Hypnotic, which is the best drink that you could ever drink in a nightclub, uh, as well as rums and vodkas and brandies and pretty much every spirit category. We just bought a mezcal as well. So, yeah, we I think there's there's not many spirit categories that we don't make at Heaven Hill. Black Velvet, which is the number two selling, the t- number two largest Canadian whiskey in the world mm-hmm. as well, as well as many others as well. So there we are. So I went a little bit over, but we started a little bit late, so I'm going to say that I nailed it. Yeah, we, we, we've done fine, I think, uh, Benji. So <laughs> you, you also added another uh, tasting note for the single barrel, uh, comparing it uh, rolls in like a luxury limo, which is a beautiful sentence, I think. So like that, pretty good. Uh, so I think uh, we're, we're we're getting to the end of the of the session. Is there any more questions? Now is the time, guys. Uh, so uh, put them in the chat um, if you want. I've enjoyed it a lot. Uh, Elijah Craig, 18-year-old, was also one of those uh, eye-opening uh, bourbons uh, in, in the beginning of my whiskey journey. Mm. So brilliant. I, I wish I'd bought more bottles back then uh, <laughs> because the price has risen quite a bit right now. But yeah. it's good stuff. Yeah. The benefit of hindsight, we would have been rich people, I tell you. If I, oh, if I yeah, just, yeah. Kept, just kept the stuff that I drank, I would have been rich, let alone not bought everything. But we we oh, would have been a lot less happy, I think, if we had exactly. drank all those, that way. stuff. Yes. <laughs> no, and I agree. Women saying great session, splendid storytelling there, Benji. It was a pleasure listening. Thank to you so much. I appreciate it. It's 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 the, the the passion with which you tell your stories. It's it's just inspiring. So um, thank you a lot for that. I think there's no really not any more questions. Maybe just one more from me. Uh, is there anything you would like to say as a closing word to our people here and the viewers later benji amazing no that's that's great for me thank you so much for for attending it's great to see so many faces uh and thank you for drinking the whiskey and hopefully i'll catch up with you all in person to drink more in the future any plans of coming to belgium in the near future yes. benji there, we we have some plans i believe it's the last weekend in september first week of october Does that sound about right then I'm just picking that out at the top of my head. It's around that time. There's some kind of whiskey festival, I believe, I'm coming over for. So oh. hopefully, fingers crossed, I'll get to meet as many of you as possible. Come up and say that you did the tasting with me. I might even have something nice special what, what, down what, underneath. Yeah, what, what's the code word? Uh, good question. I was at your tasting. <laughs> I was at your tasting. That's a, yeah, yeah. That's that's very generic, but that's pretty good. Yeah, let's let's just use hey, that one. It works. <laughs> Oh no! Anyway, yeah, Yeah, amazing. All right, Benji. So thanks a lot for uh, for doing this. Uh, Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks Sinoko for uh, making this all uh, possible. Uh, And we'll see you hopefully next time for one of the other tastings we're uh, hosting. So see you guys. Thank you so much, guys. All the best.